Hi everyone, welcome to The First Customer. Today I am lucky enough to be joined by the great uh, Chris Sarah. Hello Chris, how are you buddy? Really good Jay, good to see you. It's good to see you man. Um, Chris is a uh, a local legend. Uh, if you've met anybody in tech in Philadelphia in the past, what, 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, I don't want to age you Chris, but um, everybody knows Chris. So uh, thank you for taking some time. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, full disclosure, ArcWeb uh, was one of my first clients at JDAQA, and I bought a suit to walk down to your office uh, for the first time. <laughs> and uh, you know, we landed the deal, and it's been you know an awesome, awesome time. And we love anybody uh, that works for Chris. So um, thank you for that. But let's get started, dude. Let's talk about uh, who is Chris Sarah. You know, we're not going to bore everybody with a bunch of uh, background, but like I want to build up to to how we got to the monster today. Um, where did we start? Where did you grow up? And, you know, uh, were your parents entrepreneurs? Um, what, what was your kind of, you know, teen years looking to, to college? I grew up in Delaware County, right outside of Philadelphia. Uh, my dad uh, is an entrepreneur, was an entrepreneur uh, in the shoe biz. He had a shoe store. Uh, so he was a, a retail entrepreneur. Um, and um, yeah, I've had a number of um, uh, p- influences in my life that, that were business owners. So I uh, felt fortunate. Um, so I kind of had the bug early, even though I didn't really know what that how how that would you know be implemented later in the world but um even though i went to college and got a job like um a lot of people try to do right after college um after a, a little while of, of bouncing around on a few different jobs uh decided to uh had the confidence to to take the plunge finally awesome um so what was the first business after college i mean did you go out and start your own thing did you dip your toe in? How did you get into kind of, what was the first kickoff? And I, I don't think it was Arqua, right? You had something before that? Yeah, I, I had done some consulting. I had also had a number of, uh, at least a couple businesses that didn't really go anywhere. Um, some that never even made it to, to being incorporated. Uh, another that was incorporated, but never got a customer. Um, and then I also did some of my own consulting, uh, or, which I didn't have uh, a separate corporation for uh, for some period of time. So I had been essentially tinkering. I was doing, you know, the founder dating, uh, just talking to a lot of people that also wanted to start a business and trying to see could we work together. Uh, so I did a, a substantial amount of that, and that was also the reason for a bunch of um, you know starts that stopped you know fairly quickly. Um, but that's also how you how you get started. You know, you try to work on something with people, and you know, the, it's always best to realize that if something's not working, you you go do something else. So uh, right. there was a no, there was a number of those. So, um, but I, I think uh, what you were trying to get at too is um, the the first company that was you know I sort of told my uh, friends and family about that I was you know going to quit my job and that sort of thing was a company called Views It. Uh, which I can't really pitch this company to save my life anymore. It's been a long time. Uh, it also had pivoted so many times. Uh, I'm not even sure which which version of the pitch to give, but it was essentially a document management system uh, that initially started with a, a cloud-based document viewer uh, that allowed you to view documents, PDFs, Word documents in your browser, which you know, more than a decade ago, that was, that was something right. uh, interesting. Uh, and we created a, a company around it. Uh, called Views It. I uh, raised some money uh, in the Philly area locally, um, hired a few people over the years, uh, but it never really got to, uh, we never realized the vision and didn't really get too far. Uh, we had a lot of customers and you know some traction, but ultimately it wasn't anything to write home about. We did end up ultimately selling the business to a company called AccuSoft, but um, entrepreneurially, you know, it really was uh, a failure uh, to a large extent. And uh, we were lucky that we were able to get uh, most of the investors back uh, their money that they had invested to um, through uh, essentially becoming a consulting firm. And was that solo, th- that effort? You said we. So was there like a, who else was in on that with you? There was – well, there was initially uh, – yeah, I think a lot of businesses, there's usually sort of like one key founder. Um, right. That was not me. That was another person, uh, Brent Mansell. And then initially there was four other co-founders, um, and uh, but ultimately once uh, some funds had been raised, there was really only three of us uh, that basically quit quit our jobs and took the plunge. So that was that was views it, and okay. that that was that was sort of my first cut into the Philly entrepreneurial scene. So that was like two thousand 
seven uh, into 2008. Uh, Arco Technologies, the next company that I'd started was in 2011. So uh, between um, Fusion and ArcWeb was, you know, approximately four years that I was mm-hmm. working sort of full bore. And then in the process of trying to sell the business, um, that was sort of another two to three years uh, afterwards. And and I had already started ArcWeb, but I was still technically doing uh, some work with Fusion over that time period too. Right. Um, so I, I, I want to rewind a little bit. So you you got out of college and then um you know you kind of started doing the consulting so talk to me a little bit about that that's inter- like what was your degree in and like how did you go from like a guy who has a degree to a guy who had the confidence to go i mean consulting's a uh requires some fortitude to go out and like kind of pitch yourself and like you know and how did you how did you make that transition from like a college kid to you know doing consulting work yeah, um, it, it was more of like a friends and family um, was how I got yep. um, gigs. And ultimately, all of the gigs came from a single individual um, that had sold uh, multiple different clients on different projects. So I'd done several over over a span of a few years. But uh, but I um, initially, I worked for GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, I worked in drug discovery there. I worked there for two and a half years. I worked there while I was uh, in and out of school, so part of the co-op program, but I also worked there, worked there part-time while I was in school. So I was you know, in, in a typical, I would say, software development job in a lot of ways, um, mm-hmm. only working on you know really scientific applications, which were a lot of fun. Uh, and then I, I went to get, um, I worked in a research lab at Drexel University while I was uh, in school. And then also after I got my, my bachelor's in computer science, I got an offer to stay in the research lab that I was working uh, to get my master's degree essentially for free uh, while I did research work uh, and worked in the lab. So I, I stayed until I got my master's degree. I did uh, research in the, in the areas of computer design and some elements of, of some other things. Um, but it was ultimately I was in essentially like a software CAD lab. Right. Um, and, uh, and then after, after that, so I had, you know, a decent amount of job experience um, sort of coming out. And then I had um, some friends of mine who were doing some consulting for this, um, you know, museums do a lot of technology, custom co- technology development as, as I'm sure you're, you know, and, and mm-hmm. in Philly, there's a number of museums there. And so this person had uh, essentially sold some projects to, uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, Franklin Institute, and they were ultimately video games, kids' video games. And uh, I was working basically, I was hired as a software developer uh, working on those video games. And I was producing everything from like parts of the operating system to the software that was running on it to doing some of the game development, game design. Uh, it, was, it was a really awesome gig. Um, was that for the, uh, what it was. Is, those, those aren't the ones that were the, because uh, my kids, unfortunately, uh, I have five of them. So I've been to Chop plenty of times. Um, is that the ones that like the big projection went onto the floor and they could like walk around on it and interact with it? So I have, a, so there, there was, um, three different, <clears throat> excuse me, kiosks in the emergency room. Um, and I'm blanking on the exact time period. My hunch is that when you were a dad, those machines were already gone and they had okay. been replaced, okay. um, by other, other systems. Uh, but the company I was consulting for was called Museum Interactive Technologies. They were on 11th and Buttonwood mm-hmm. um, in the, I guess that's Callow Hill area of, uh, of Philadelphia. And uh, and I did consulting there, and that was uh, where I did a number of projects. But I, I didn't have to do the really hard things, which is the business development to find the consulting client. It was more that I was a good engineer and had some of the skills that were needed for the job and my friends were working with them. And so fortunately I just got a connection and it was pretty, it was relatively easy, uh, in the grand scheme of things. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's, that's kind of, that makes a lot more sense now. Um, and then you kind of kept that vein going. So let's fast forward back, uh, pre arc web, uh, where, you know, how did you make the jump? You know, you've used it kind of fizzled, I think it's, you know, so where, where did you, where did you end up in those four years and how did you start ArcWeb after that? Yep. Um, so um, the, um, you know, we had raised money and it was a pretty complex scenario because uh, ultimately the business wasn't profitable enough to a point where it could return any capital to the investors. And so uh, it became, you know, more of a, how do we exit gracefully? Um, And um, 
so the investors ultimately had to get out. We also had uh, a lot of customers on the platform and we didn't want to, you know, just send them a notice for shutting everything down in 30 days. Good luck, you know, right. migrating your application. So we didn't want to do that at all either. So we wanted to find someone who would buy it, um, knowing that it wasn't going to make uh, the investors whole, um, but ultimately to try to uh, see how, how far we could get. In the meantime, we decided to start doing consulting uh, in and around document management software. So we were lucky in that an investor of ours, uh, was in a group uh, that also included uh, an executive uh, at one of our clients, um, or excuse me, an executive who later became one of our clients at ING Direct. And uh, we were able to get an introduction there. And ultimately, they had a specific challenge invol involving uh, check processing. And we had proposed to them that we could uh, deliver a solution to them in a time period that uh, they, they really needed it in. And uh, so we got sort of a bluebird first project, and that, that we had to hustle really hard from a business development perspective to get the proposal on there, figure out, you know, when we can actually deliver the system and, and make sure that the proposal was very good um, and then leverage everything that we could in terms of relationships um, and um, our experience in the area in order to convince them that we were uh, the right the right uh, company for the job. And uh, so we were, we were lucky in that we successfully did that. And then we, we ended up doing... Um, several more projects after that. Um, and ultimately that was enough to, you know, fix the uh, financial gap that we needed in order to get the investors out uh, in a way that everybody would agree to. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, so, so part of that, so anyway, so I'll get to your, your question. So, so I had to basically give my notice that I was going to go do something else um, as part of the negotiation with the investors um, to essentially allow my, allow me to go, uh, with my chin up. And, uh, and so I created, uh, ArcWeb Technologies really just to, uh, sort of symbolize that I was, I was moving on. I was starting a new company and, um, it was essentially for real. Um, I, I had assumed, uh, that I would work on some other startup, uh, with ArcWeb Technologies, but I really didn't know exactly what that would be. Wow. So that was the, that was how it happened. And then after, um, so we continue to do consulting work, um, through the, through views it, um, as, as we, um, as I had created ArcWeb, um, and I made a, another essentially deal with my two co-founders and I said, what, you know, we're paying off the investors and then whatever profits are left, you folks can basically have it. Um, I'm going to go do this other thing. Um, and that, that was, that's the executive summary version. It was a bit more complicated than that, but, um, but they, but, you know, you know, exiting a company is really complex. So you have to figure out how do you make it work for everybody? And this was, you know, I'm just going through all the different motions of what, what I needed to do to kind of gracefully exit. Uh, and that worked out, you know, really well. Um, so they continued to operate it for some period of time. We actually found a buyer through the investment banker that we had hired, but then the deal fell through. So they ended up operating that company for a few more years um, until we eventually, uh, AccuSoft, um, bought it. And it was bought by like our biggest competitor um, when we were really uh, toiling in the weeds, um, had his company acquired by AccuSoft. And then he was coming along and basically buying uh, the fumes that were left uh, of our company. So uh, it was a, it was a, a bittersweet uh, moment. But actually, one of the things that I really learned from that experience was um, if you're thinking about exiting your company, you should really be talking to your competition probably at some point earlier than um, what we did in that instance, which is way late. And I think there's certainly approach and a strategy to when it makes sense to, to do that. I, in our case, I think we waited too long because um, I think we would have been able to get even more um, out of the deal, uh, had we just sort of like said, we're going to do it sooner, but we were all kind of, in, you know, personally a little grumpy, uh, that this person right. had kind of wiped our, uh, <laughs> wiped the wall with, the <laughs> right. Right. Um, so you do all that. You kind of say, sayonara guys, I'm going to ride off into the sunset. And is this the first time, uh, you kind of, did it on your own? Like you were kind of, this is just Chris's show and ArcWeb is going to be my deal. And first of all, where did ArcWeb the name come from? Um, I wanted to, just from like a design perspective, I wanted it sort of like a meaningless term that wouldn't have a lot of collisions from like a trademark perspective or whatever. Um, so, um, and I had, uh, I, my cousin had a company um, that he had named after another person uh, by using their initials. So, uh, I wanted to try to tie in my my 
grandmom's initials uh, into the name. So ARC is actually my uh, the first oh, three letters of my grandma's that. initials. Oh, so that's where the yeah. R comes from. And then the web, I felt like was just, you know, another way of describing a lot of the what we do. But um, I, I didn't want people to think we were like necessarily a web development firm, but I felt like the web to most people, you know, and at the time, like Web 2.0 had already happened. So I right. felt like the web had a much uh, broader name. And so Arc Web to me is is what made sense. There was way more uh, really like significant meaning behind that than I than I've ever heard. That's like such a great uh, story, dude. I didn't. I that's. I, I will. Uh, I can't wait to tell Autumn that story because uh, she's like she's a such an arc web cheerleader. Um, so you you stepped aside um, and now you're doing your own thing. What what the hell do you do from there? Like you did you have clients that you pulled in from existing places? Did you have a, a queue of work lined up that like I mean, you wouldn't have, at this point, it's not exactly Chris Sarah, the consultant, who's kind of got some experience and jumping off to do his own business. This is like Chris Sarah, who's done the, done the dance, knows how a business works, and is kind of ready to do his own thing. Like, what, what does that look like? Yeah, uh, thanks. So the thing, there was a few things that I, that I had learned on the, on the business development side uh, in the course of doing Views It um, that... Um, were really valuable. One is just building a list of people uh, that you need to contact and, and need to engage with and then executing it, right? Um, and I saw it really done well when we hired the investment banker and watching this individual kind of cut through a list that we had provided um, was like really impressive because I'd never actually seen it before. Um, even though I'd worked in organizations where you know I'd been on the same floor as salespeople, but I really hadn't seen it in a big organization. And so so I, I was getting busy at that time. So I kind of knew like, all right, I need to you know do a certain amount of business development activity. So I'm going to spend a certain period of my time every day um, doing doing business development, quote unquote. Yep. And uh, what I did was I, I later called this the awesome pipeline. I basically built a spreadsheet of everybody I knew that was awesome. Uh, and whether I knew them or not. Right. So, so, and, um, and I had basically sort of three things that, um, I was you know pitching, I guess, if I met with somebody, um, I was telling them one, just updating them about sort of my last company two, um, saying that I was looking for, you know, other opportunities to co-found a business or whatever else three, I'm doing consulting in the meantime. So I basically met with as many awesome people as I could. I said what I was doing. Um, and just try to see, is there any synergy, uh, with others? I actually still have the spreadsheet or at least like a slightly later version. It might be, you know, maybe a year after I was doing this, but basically I just, I noted in the spreadsheet, I didn't have a CRM. I just noted in the spreadsheet the last time I contacted them and I had like the first three things like emailed once call, you know, and I had just, I put inside the date. Um, and then every day, I can't remember exactly what time, but generally speaking, I try to do like my core priority, high priority work in the morning. So it was like, let's just say it was nine to 10 or nine to 11. Um, this is now, you know, more than 10 years ago, I was basically making sure that I was working activity inside that spreadsheet mm -hmm. during that time period. Cause I knew that eventually like the consulting work, I would find some. And, and so now to get to your question, Jay, so it ended up being that I got referrals from a lot of people, um, the, one of the best ones that I got was the investment from uh, one of the par partners or investors in one of the investment groups that invested in my last company, who I basically said that same story to the three things. Um, and he basically said, oh, I, I, I know somebody that's trying to start a new company, and I think it would be perfect if he starts working with you. Um, and uh, that happened. I was also... Um, trying to work, you know, so I had multiple things that were looking like as good as that, uh, sort of at the same time, it, it took me, you know, it definitely took a few months and I was consulting still consulting for my last company, uh, and for ING direct, you know, to basically put food on the table, um, while I was doing this, uh, and then looking for other consulting projects. Um, and it sounds insane, but I was actually working on another startup while I was doing all of this too. So um, I had, um, I was really obsessed with CRM as a concept. Um, and I was working on what I was calling PRM at the time, personal relationship management. I feel like it is somewhat of a category now. Um, but I feel like it's, you know, probably different than what I was envisioning. But um, I was basically trying to make a glorified address book um, that that someone would be so enamored with that they would actually bounce the phone icon, you know, on your on your phone and, right. and use this because it would be better, uh, of course. So uh, I was working on that um, until I had, you know, close to nine or 10 um, uh, 
or at least three projects going simultaneously with like multiple contractors. And I finally said to myself, you know, I actually, this consulting is actually working better um, than any other business I've started before. Right. And um, maybe I'll just stop working on this CRM thing um, after a while. But um, I jumped ahead there a little bit. Um, so I was getting projects. Um, it looked like the thing was going to happen. Uh, that was the referral from um, the investment group. Um, there was another person who worked for a private equity advisory company. He was starting a company um, and I, and I basically convinced him uh, to do a project with him. And then, and then the third thing that had sort of hit around the same time was MakerBot, um, you know, the 3d printing company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, you know, the a great story there is that I had uh, an engineering manager at MakerBot who I knew for many, many years. So I was leveraging, you know, a known trusted relationship. And then their uh, head of product or their procurement, per I think it was procurement, I can't remember. He actually knew uh, the procurement person at ING Direct where I was already consulting. Uh, and then that was a reference. And then I got MakerBot. Um, and, uh, and the other project uh, that I mentioned with the entrepreneur from the investment group uh, is what became QTrack uh, with Gary Shank. So Gary Shank was uh, that person and he's an investor and entrepreneur uh, and, a, and a great person. Um, and uh, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot um, and I had to basically hire people pretty quickly, but I was only hiring um, 1099 contractors. And, mm -hmm. um, and I had a mix of things where I was hiring people for um, the company I was consulting for. And then I had um, um, another situation uh, that was developing where I was hiring my own. And, right. um, and in very, very early um, in the process, I actually had a project that went kind of sideways and, and it went sideways. And it, it's funny because I remember having a conversation with the founder and uh, he had showed me a PowerPoint deck that literally was an app with three screens um, so after we had been, you know, in production and built several versions, you know, this thing had way more than three screens and a ton of stuff, and it was just right. getting more and more complex, and um, and uh, and it was getting expensive. So we were way over the budget that we had forecasted. Um, and then he said that he wanted to call it quits, and I had to, you know, sort of make amends with the scenario and everything. And what I realized was that I was kind of fooling myself into thinking that. I, you know, so I didn't, I was hiring people for him. So I wasn't taking any accounting or legal risk. Um, but I was still taking essentially a reputational risk and that it was my reputation, um, on, on the line. And so I, I sort of fooled myself into thinking that, uh, if I wasn't taking the financial risk or legal risk or whatever, um, then I was somehow in a safer place. But what I realized is actually that my reputation is even more important um, than those other things. And so I'm just as much at risk. And so uh, that was the last project where I was hiring people for my clients. And uh, instead, from that point on, I decided that I was just going to uh, hire the people myself and manage them myself. Um, and, and that way, you know, the, the risk would still be, you know, on me reputationally, but but ultimate and ultimately I could have a lot more control too, because, you know, sometimes projects fail because the manager is, is working, is directing you to work on the wrong things. And as an engineer, I can't tell you how many times I worked on products that I knew were absolutely not going to work because right. either they had terrible design, they did no testing, there was no product management or whatever. Um, and people were like, no, 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 well, you're the engineer, just, just build this thing. And I'm like, right. okay, keep coding away. <laughs> um, so, um, where does this take us in the arc web journey? Um, you know, I, I, what I see today um, may not be an accurate representation of, you know, where it was to start for sure. So like, where was the kind of in between, you know, like where you guys evolved over time. And so talk about going from 1099 to W2 and maybe that's where some of that stuff started. Right. Because I've, I've yep. personally, you know, dealt with that, uh, you know, that situation and, and, you know, grappled with all the both sides of, of, you know, the pros and cons. So that had to be a pretty big change for you. Uh, yeah. So, um, there was, I, I believe the number was 11. So I had 11, uh, contractors that were all working, um, you know, close to 40 hours or more, um, depending upon the project. And, um, and, and I was still working on that CRM uh, product product or PRM product. Um, and I had basically made that decision that I mentioned earlier where I'm like, you know, this is really working. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, maybe I'll just start working on this other startup and see how far I can take uh, this consulting company. Um, and um, 
so the next hire was essentially an, an operations person. So the first hire of ArcWeb was essentially an operations person who also had a legal background. Uh, and so he just really helped uh, in a lot of ways um, get the, the, the fabric of the company going um, from you know, being able to hire employees, you know, and, and whatnot moving forward, um, benefits and all of those things. Um, and eventually we, you know, um, we, we stopped, um, hire, you know, we, we stopped hiring contractors. We moved everybody to be a W2 employee um, and have, you know, focused on really how do we build a place, place that's one of the best places to work sure. uh, for employees um, uh, over time. So, you know, it's certainly a lot different now than, than it was back then. And that, that time period, I would say, is probably like six, seven years ago. We grew pretty fast um, in the first few. So it was dormant for a few years because I was just, you know, it was basically a shell company while I was consulting for one client, my, my mm-hmm. former company. Um, and then, and then um, when I started consulting in it for real, uh, it, it grew pretty fast. So it's probably, you know, six, seven years ago now at this point. Uh, is where we are, where I'm hiring my first employee. Uh, and then over time, um, you know, we hired more than 20 people um, in uh, in the next few years. Um, and uh, and then, like I said, over time, actually ratcheted down our, our contractor pool. Um, and, and we didn't we didn't tell anyone that, you know, they weren't hired anymore. It just we did. We stopped right. hiring people. And then eventually people, you know, just like any other um, gig that they're working on, they decide to go somewhere else. Were you able to do that because you had kind of um, de-risked like the other side of the business by having like a constant flow of clients and all. I mean, because that's the real concern, right? When you switch from W or 1099 to W2 is um, now I'm liable for everything all the time, 40 hours a week, et cetera, et cetera you know, benefits and everything else. And these people's livelihoods are dependent on it. When the contractor stuff is almost like, it feels like there's an, agree- there's an unknown, you know, an unsaid agreement where it's like, you're a contractor and it's scalable, and with that comes the flexibility on, on on their side to be a contractor, just like I was for a decade. So, um, is that uh, it? Was that the way that you were able to kind of make that change? We're like, all right, I'm just going to go W two now. I'm going to pay everybody, you know, a salary and do that sort of thing. Is that because you had you knew you had established a business that could kind of survive the ups and downs of of the W two employment compared to having 1099s, which are more flexible? So um, I would say it was more about just accepting the risk than having, you know, confidence knowing that there's, you know, pipe there. Uh, that sounds forever. like a, that sounds like a very uh, recurring theme for you. <laughs> it's just <laughs> just think that think that you want it and take the risk. I like that. I mean, it's I mean, that's how you that's, you know, that's why you've been successful. Um, so and so interestingly enough, your first customer was a was kind of a, an existing previous customer, which happens to be the same frequency. Uh, I hear that very often. A lot, you know, it's the first customer or somebody's first consulting thing or something, which is why when I, when people ask me, you know, hey, I do marketing or I do whatever and I've done it for years and it's like, just pick up some consulting work to start. Like you got to pick up a side project, go to Upwork, go to Fiverr, go to where, you know, do some project for somebody, you know, that runs a business. Um, that's my recommendation. Uh, you know, you've even, you know, you and I have, send each other people and talked about stuff. I mean, what is your suggestion to those people that are in that, you know, coming up? Uh, how do people get into consulting in 2022? I mean, it may be even a, a hard question for you to answer at this point, you know, cause the landscape has changed. Well, I think I, the landscape certainly has changed. However, I think, um, you know, so much of business development is around relationships and trust and, um, the thing is, when you decide that you're going to be a consultant at any point in your life, you know, by that point, you probably do have people that really do trust you, right? If you think of you know childhood friends and you know people that have known you your entire life, um, you know they they don't know you professionally, but they trust you, right? So so I think leveraging that to the extent that you can is so important. Um, and people often forget that they do actually have a network um, that that they can leverage. Uh, they just never have leveraged it, so they're not even thinking about how to leverage it. Um, so, so it was very much uh, me reaching out to, like I said, the awesome pipeline. So I both love, a, a dude. I love every. <laughs> I love that, dude. You should patent that, man. That's I, I have. I have my versions of those too uh, over the years. I have you know my stupid color coded that means nothing that gets outdated, and you know there's just a bunch. So yeah, I I love the awesome pipeline. That's a great way. <laughs> 
um, to describe it. Let's switch to see, you know, uh, Chris Sarah today, the dad uh, doing a million things. You've got a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I, I can't be the only one. Um, we're not, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and say it, Chris, you're a little bit older than I am, which I'm fine with. But uh, people at our age, um, you know, how are you staying healthy, dude? What are you doing? What are you actually trying to do to live longer for your kids and for, you know, just to keep doing stuff forever? So I, I have, you know, sort of bouts in and out of uh, taking better care of myself. Um, right now, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, so I, I try to run. Um, it's, it's one of the easiest things for me to do, um, cause I just run, walk out the door and, and start running. Uh, I certainly stretch for a while, but, but running is, is a key, um, part of my life at the moment. Um, I can run somewhere between six and 10 miles, uh, generally speaking. Um, also do, uh, a frequent practicer of meditation. Um, and I try to do that for five minutes a day. Uh, and those two things keep me pretty sane, um, and I highly recommend <laughs> to, to anyone, uh, generally speaking. I, I love it. I love it. I think 10 to 30 minutes. Somebody said it one time. I was watching some talk show. I think it was Harry Connick Jr. for some reason. He was like, I do 30, he's like 10 to 30 minutes of exercise a day regardless. And I, I like, I try to do that. And it does make just the physical part and the meditation is huge too. There's an app. Have you tried the uh, waking up app with, uh, what's his name? Sam. Do you try that? Yeah, that's, that's the one I've been using. So, um, Free plug for him. Uh, I, I use Insight Timer, um, but honestly, I just I I uh, since I've been doing it so long, I feel like I've done it more than a thousand times at this point. So I I just basically have silence. I don't I don't use a a dictation that's it, that's, or uh, guided, a guided or meditation. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, at least you know, generally speaking, not not most days. But again, I I only keep myself to five minutes, which is pretty short. But um, for me, you know, it's more about frequency. Have you done any like training in it or anything, or is it just kind of you picked it up over the years? Mostly just um, that app and guided meditations through it. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I've got one last question for you, which is the, my, one of my favorites. Um, and it's, fun, it's fun asking a really successful person this question, too, because I'd love to hear the answer. Uh, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? I love the silence because I know, and I'm not going to rush you through it. Uh, I'll give you a second, but uh, it's one of my favorites. And I'll tell you one of my favorite answers I heard in a minute. Or do you want the answer first? No, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't, I don't want to lead the witness. You know, I, so, so much of my brain gets bent more towards um, social issues and justice. And, you know, so when you say something like that, I immediately think, of, you know, along those lines and not necessarily sure. about like business, um, but, you know, I feel like, um, consistent high quality education is so, uh, so important and so, uh, needed, uh, in, in the city and the state, uh, and across the, the country. So, uh, I would love to, uh, to see that happen, but it's not really my, uh, my area, but if I could choose, I would probably pick some big problem like that. And, uh, that's where I would sink my teeth for a while. All right. I like it. I like it. Um, no, it didn't have to be business related, but I like that you picked a cause. Uh, my favorite is from my wife's cousin, Kim, uh, who listened to one of my episodes and texted me and said, uh, climbing Mount Everest. I was like, that's a great one. That's like maybe the best one ever. Like, cause I would definitely, uh, try to climb Mount Everest if I knew I couldn't fail. So, uh, I like that one a lot, but yeah, the, you know, I, I grapple with that too. My, I have five kids, obviously, like I've said, and, uh, education is a huge part of that. Um, I saw a bunch of weird stuff with being successful and unsuccessful during the pandemic on virtual schooling. So it made me kind of wonder like, what's, was the traditional model? Does that work? Could it, could virtual be a, th yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but I like that. I like that answer. Um, all right. I'm going to let you get at it. You've, you've probably got three more startups to start before the end of the day. Um, I'm going to see you. What? Give me the details on your ArcWeb 10-year uh, anniversary. Uh, so we are having an open house um, next month, and I wasn't ready to plug the date but I because I it's don't okay. remember. It's but, no, I think it's November um, 18th. No, is that right? Ray? Hold on. We are, we are, yeah. We turned 10 during the pandemic, and so uh, we were sort of denied uh, having an open house. So 
uh, we're making up for it now, even though we're a little bit older than 10, but we're having our 10 year open house. Right. Um, well, we're going to find the date before we end this. Uh, if I find this date before you, Chris, with all your plans, uh, I see the invitation. Uh, November 18th. I was right. 4 p.m. Look at that. All right. So November 18th, 4 p.m. Uh, I will definitely try to be there. And I think Autumn's going to be there. And I'm sure half the city of Philadelphia is going to be there. Because we all love you, Chris. Thank you man. so much. You're the man. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate you giving me some of your time today, buddy. I'll talk to you soon, okay? My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Great talking to you. Have a great day. You're the man, Chris. Thanks, buddy. See you later.